Kurt Neary, and I want to welcome you to today's webinar, Very Different Voices, Celebrating the Diversity of Perspective in Sexual Violence Prevention, presented by David Prescott and Robin Wilson. Before turning this over to David and Robin, I want to take a moment to tell you about the Neary Press. Our mission is to share cutting-edge research on best practices emerging in our field. For many years, we accomplished that mission only through book sales. But with changes in both the publishing and the technology worlds, we are exploring with over the last five years, we have offered online courses, free newsletters, face-to-face -face workshops, and now most recently, these webinars by some of our internationally recognized authors. But unlike many other publishers, each of us at Neary Press is a professional working with you in the field. But we seek to determine what are the most pressing questions, the most urgent training needs, or the most desired presenters, we can accomplish our goals better if we have your suggestions, input, and feedback. Whether positive or negative, we really appreciate the engagement with you, so please contact us with your questions, critiques, or suggestions. Now, just out of curiosity, how many people listening have participated in a Neary Press webinar before? Tim will activate the poll button now so you can register your um, vote. Right, and we'll get back to that in a little bit. It looks like, let's see if I'm reading this right, 163 out of 500 have attended before. That's great. I'll talk a little more about this a little bit more. But if you find these webinars helpful, we hope you'll consider becoming a sponsor of this series. Like NPR, it's your donations that help make this series happen. We are excited to announce a whole new slate of webinars for the 2016-2017 season which are now posted on our website. Become a sponsor now and guarantee yourself a seat for every webinar in the entire series. As a sponsor, we will not only register you and 15 staff members if you're part of an organization for each webinar, we can also offer you a free gift of two of our books, Current Perspectives and Current Applications, or two other books, excuse me, um, if you have already received these. We can now also offer free C credits for all those who attend the live webinar. Truly a win-win for all of us, and it's your support that allows us to continue to bring these free resources as well. Little housekeeping details. First, as with all workshops, I want to let you know the learning experience objectives. These include to expand the knowledge base of sexual violence prevention practitioners, to suggest and demonstrate models of case conceptualization, and to celebrate diversity and clinical perspective in sexual violence prevention. The second issue is to let you know that the PowerPoint file will be posted on the Neary Press website shortly after the first webinar is over. We will also be posting a recording of this webinar next week. Third, when the work workshop is over, please be sure to answer the short survey at the end. We truly would love your feedback. And finally, after about a week, we will send you a follow-up email that has a link to the recordings and links to certificates of attendance, which you can download. This year, Neary Press is partnering with Global Institute for Forensic Research, or GIFR, to provide free CE credits to those of you who attend our live webinar. You should have been given a chance to sign up when you register. If you, for some reason, did not see that option on our registration form, or you've since changed your mind about wanting CE credits, please email Kristen Lobish at klobish at neary.com. That's K-L-O-B-I-S-C-H at neary.com and Giffer will be in touch with you about taking a short quiz to qualify for your CE credits. I want to mention the book that David and Robin will discuss during this webinar. The foundations of very different voices are, first, research shows that the importance of the clinician in effective treatment, and second, the importance of case conceptualization as a learning tool for our field. Topics covered range from risk needs responsivity to strength-based approaches and beyond, including topics that challenge all of us in the field of sexual violence prevention. The book includes chapters by internationally recognized experts like Joanne Schledale, Robert Longo, Thomas Graves, Kevin Powell, Phil Rich, and many others. We're pleased to offer a special discount on Very Different Voices until January 15th of 2017. When you order, please use the discount code NOVE22 when you check out to get this 20% off the book. So that's N-O-V-E as in the first five letters of November, or four letters of November, and then 22 when you check out to get the book. 
I would like to take a moment to introduce our speakers. Both are very well known, but um, let me give you some of the details of the background. David Prescott serves as Director of Professional Development and as a Clinical Director for the Beckett Family of Services. Dedicated to building healthy lives and safe communities, he has produced 14 book projects and numerous articles and chapters in the areas of assessing and treating sexual violence and trauma. Mr. Prescott is a current fellow and past president of the Association for the Treatment of Sexual Abusers, the largest professional organization of its kind in the world. He is also the 2014 recipient of that organization's Distinguished Contribution Award, one of only a handful of recipients. Previously, he received the Bright Lights Award from the National Adolescent Perpetrator Network in 2007. He is a certified trainer for the International Center for Clinical Excellence and a member of the Motivational Interviewing Network of Trainers. He has lectured around the world, including most recently in Australia, Japan, Germany, Iceland, Poland, Romania, Canada, and the UK. He also serves on the editorial boards of three scholarly journals, Motivational Interviewing, Training Research and Implementation and Practice, The Journal of Sexual Aggression, and Sexual Abuse, a Journal of Research and Treatment. Mr. Prescott is also co-editor of our very own Neary News, which is read by thousands of professionals each month. Robin Williams, PhD, uh, is a research educator and board certified clinical psychologist who has worked with sexual and other offenders in hospital, correctional, and private practice settings for more than 30 years. He presently maintains an international practice in consulting psychology based in Sarasota, Florida, and is an assistant clinical professor adjunct of psychiatry and behavioral neurosciences at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. Robin's current interests are focused on collaborative models of risk management and restorations as persons of risk are transitioned from institutional to community settings. He has published and presented internationally on the diagnosis and treatment of social and sexual psychopathology, in addition to being a member of the editorial boards of Sexual Abuse, a Journal of Research and Treatment, the Journal of Sexual Aggression, and the Howard Journal of Criminal Justice. So without further ado, let me turn this over to David and Robin. Now it says I'm unmuted. Here I am. This, hi, folks. Uh, my name is David Prescott, and I'm going to do a quick reality check. Tim, I think you should uh, uh, be able to see my slides and hear my voice, but if uh, um, if you can't, just let me know. So again, a uh, a great big welcome here, and uh, thank you, Craig, for the uh, for the very nice um, introduction. It's my first. Uh, uh, time doing a webinar with both uh, Craig and Robin at the same time um, is absolutely a, uh, a wonderful honor. Um, I'm going to get right into it. We've got a lot of material to cover and want to leave as much time for discussion as possible. So here you see the, uh, the, the final result, uh, very different voices, but I just want to say that the original story for this, uh, for this project uh, goes back to a phone call, uh, actually several phone calls, between myself and Steve Bengis, uh, who uh, is the former executive director for NERI and who um, sadly and tragically passed away during the production of this, uh, uh, of this book. But uh, Steve and I and Robin were having a string of conversations in which we, uh, we, we said quite bluntly, we fear for the future of case conceptualization, case formulation, and to some degree, um, assessment-driven treatment, uh, having uh, watched uh, several changes um, in, in our field. And so we, uh, we thought we would put together sort of a, a volume of practical applications where we could ask some of the best and the brightest in the field to, uh, to share their ideas, um, uh, not only about the models and approaches that they use, uh, but uh, where good treatment has gotten better through their efforts, um, how they learned from their mistakes, and so on and so forth. And so um, just uh, you'll probably see us on camera a little bit later on, but just so that you know who you're talking to, that's me over on the left. Uh, yes, my appearance has changed uh, a little bit since the uh, last photograph that you saw 
Uh, some people suggest maybe I'm wanted in another state or that it's a desperate cry for help, but I like to think that uh, uh, we can all change our appearance at any time in our life, and it's a celebration of the fact that people can and do change. Um, over there on the right is uh, my dear friend, collaborator, and colleague of many years, uh, Robin Wilson, who will be uh, speaking in just a moment. So uh, that's uh, that's at least a brief introduction to us, and we'll be speaking with you uh, more uh, later as a uh, part of the dialogue. So we're going to start just with some very brief background information. Robin is going to give us some perspectives on the principles of risk and need and responsivity. Uh, we'll also talk about case formulation. Uh, Robin and I will each discuss a case that, uh, that we contributed to this project and then talk about some of the implications of what we found um, in, doing this, uh, in doing this project. Um, and uh, if there's anything that we learned in actually editing this book, it's that, in fact, the, uh, the best therapists and the best, the best practitioners uh, in our field really, truly do have very different voices. Um, there's many possible perspectives in doing this work. But, um, but first, let me just say, here's my take-home messages, our take-home messages. Um, I, uh, I look at the people who work in our field and consider them, uh, you all, to be superheroes. I really believe that the work you do matters and that the work you do is effective. Even though this can be a controversial area within the field in terms of treatment outcome research, I've seen many, many more people uh, helped uh, by, going through, uh, by going through treatment programs than I've seen harmed. I, uh, and I know I speak for Robin when I say we should also always follow the research and be as data-driven as we possibly can. We talk a lot about evidence-based practice, and increasingly, I think there's not enough discussion about developing our own in-house practice-based evidence. Uh, at the same time, I always say, beware of false advertising. Uh, I really want to return the, the onus of clinical work back to, uh, to clinicians and to remind uh, people that who the professional is very often makes more of a difference than uh, the differences between the models that we use. And that we should therefore always keep the big picture in mind. When we get onto um, the subway or onto airplanes or what have you and the person next to us um, asks us what we do for a living, it's always important to remember that we're in the field of sexual violence prevention. Uh, even if we're working purely with people who've abused uh, once they've gotten out of prison uh, or what have you. And so with this, I'm going to turn it over to Robin to, uh, to talk about the principles of uh, risk and need and responsivity. Good, Robin? Okay, there I am. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, David. Good afternoon to everyone who's online. I just want to thank Craig for the very nice introduction and, and um, for calling me Robin Williams, uh, which is always funny to hear. Um, you know, my mother once called me that, so so I take it in stride, and I like that actually Robin was in the background of uh, Superman and Batman doing the high five, so I feel like I got included in the superheroes there. Um, <laughs> most of us in the field by this point are probably reasonably, reasonably familiar with the risk-need responsivity model and those, those three principles. Um, you'll notice that the names of the book have switched. It's now Bonten Andrews, and that's because we lost Dina, Don Andrews um, a few years ago. Uh, he passed away, but uh, you know certainly the stamp that these two fellows have put on the sort of general the the general criminological literature is very very big. Um, I don't know if I can switch these slides. In fact, David, can you, if you have control, uh, can you apologies. The next one? Here we are. Yes. Yeah, yeah, no problem. So the the three principles, and I I'm giving you a very very short little. Uh, sort of primer on this here, but, but basically what these principles tell us are, or you know, guide us in, in our work with our clients is basically um, the first principle, the risk principle is, is essentially about dosage or who should we target? You know, do we want to give the same thing to everyone? Do we want to give everyone intensive treatment or does that not make much sense? Um, research literature pretty clear that uh, those people who have, who have the greatest uh, you know, risk to reoffend. Um, those are the people that we probably need to target. 
Um, in our field, um, I'm always mindful of the fact that we have a very positively skewed distribution. Most of the, the people who get scored on the static 99R um, have scores that put them in the low to low moderate risk range. That's about 70% of the actual distribution. And only 10% are in that high risk range um, of scores of six or higher. Um, so we should be uh, aiming ourselves at and you know using our best stuff with the people who are most likely to benefit from it. So that's the who to target for intervention. The need principle, equally simple, figure out what their problems are. Um, and I think this is a lot of where we get into the case conceptualization aspect of things and where David are, um, and I are gonna talk about this uh, as we go forward is that what are we gonna do with them? Where do they have problems? What are the general needs that they, uh, you know, that they demonstrate that are, are the areas that got them into trouble in the first place? And how might we be able to uh, you know, do something about that? So that's the what to target for intervention. The last principle is the one that I think we still consistently screw up. And this is the one that basically talks about how we're going to target the individual's issues. Um, and this is the principle of responsivity. Um, and I think, again, this is the one that we tend not to do quite as well. And I know that, that you know, certainly it was in my mind when going through the chapters as we were putting this, this book together, we wanted to make sure that we had lots of information about how best you could work with people that would uh, sort of ultimately diminish the problems that they were experiencing. Um, flip to the next slide, David, please. Mm -hmm. so, so we know that risk is not just all about the individual, that sometimes it has some environmental and some situational elements. So it's that mix of, of what the individual brings to the table and where he or she finds him or herself. And it's those two elements that contribute. Next slide, please, David. Where we're talking about risk factors, these are the sort of general ones. And of course, most people who are on this webinar will know that we've got two major overarching risk factors, and those are the two top ones there. The extent to which someone has, has deviant sexual interests or preferences, and then the amount of uh, sort of core antisociality that, that they uh, have in their values and attitudes and uh, that they express in their behavior. But uh, those of you who are, are familiar with tools like the Stable 2007 will, will probably recognize some of these other ones here. So the biggies, I guess, are uh, sexual self-regulation and general self-regulation. How well does the individual handle him or herself and how well do they handle themselves when they're doing anything with respect to sexuality? So these are all things that, that probably need to get focused on with many of our clients. Next slide, please, David. In, in terms of the responsivity principle, and this again is the one I said that we don't generally tend to do quite as well, um, you, know, I'm, you know, usually mindful of the idea that we need to be careful to do our, to, to do our interventions with people, not to people. There are times when, uh, you know, when I think treatment becomes a little bit dog, becomes a bit dogmatic, and we forget that uh, that each and every person that we're working with has has an individualized aspect to them that we need to be mindful of. So we need to look at how well they're going to interface with the programming we're offering um, because of things that they bring to the table, or per perhaps some of the uh, some of the situational factors that are are often beyond beyond the client's uh, actual control and things that we just need to be uh, you know, keeping in our, our thoughts when we're trying to pull the programming together. Um, David, next slide, please. This is one of my favorite cartoons. Um, I, I taught Stripe how to whistle. I don't hear him whistling. I said I taught him. I didn't say he learned it. And it's that, that learning aspect that's so critically important for us. If we're going to spend the time to put people into programs and to have them stay there for months or, or years, uh, you know, depending on which program they're in, it's critically important for us not to be wasting their time and hours. Uh, the ultimate goal is, of course, for the client to, to get better, uh, to be able to live their lives, and for us not to uh, be so concerned about them. So did we miss a couple of slides there, David? Uh, we, um, I skipped ahead a couple, but we're, we're on track. Sorry about that. Okay. So um, in, in the recent past, we've, we've seen um, a lot of focus switching from you know, kind of traditionally 
uh, you know, kind of risk-based uh, risk-based programming to looking at strengths. So, so not just a matter of what's wrong, but what's right. And if we have stuff that's right, you know, how how can we uh, focus on that? That's going to help our clients do better. Um, so, in in the past, um, you know, we've 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 spent a lot of time looking at what's wrong, and uh, you know, trying to figure out how how likely it is that those behaviors will persist. The shift we're seeing now is to try and find out what's going right in the person's life, and if we emphasize those and maybe enhance some of those 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 you know, kind of protective factors. Um, how likely it is is it that the client will desist? Um, and I think you know certainly desistance is is a, is a new zeitgeist I think in our field. Moving on, um, in terms of case conceptualization and case formulation, you know, I think to myself I try to remember whether or not I was actually taught this when I was in school. And I can remember having some courses that talked about, you know, different diagnoses and how to make diagnoses and that sort of thing. But I'm not sure that anybody ever sort of sat us down as students and said, this is how you figure out what the problem is and this is how you figure out how you're supposed to do something about it. Um, um, I certainly learned that through some of the internships and other you know, practical experiences I had. But I'm not sure that I got any really good educational opportunities on this. Um, we know that case formulation starts with fact gathering. You've got to get assessment information. Um, I'm a strong believer in functional behavioral analysis. Uh, the idea that that um, we can learn an awful lot about the problem by trying to figure out what it was that the client was trying to achieve. Um, with many of our clients, they're you know perhaps trying to achieve some sort of intimacy in a very maladaptive way, or they're trying to to you know go get some sort of sexual release. But they, uh, but they do so in a very narcissistic or a very selfish sort of way. So, you know, what is the, the client trying to achieve? Is the goal intact? You know, is, is the goal that they were trying to meet um, a reasonable goal, but the means that they use is perhaps the problem? Or were the means fine, but the goal is actually problematic? So uh, doing a little bit of that functional behavioral analysis, I think, uh, functional behavioral analysis can really shed some light on um, uh, you know the nature of the issue um, and we know that we uh, we like to do individualized approaches uh, the research has been very clear on that in the recent past um, that that we can't just do everything with everybody that we actually have to spend some time figuring out what our individual clients needs are next slide David Okay, and I'm actually just going to add a, a couple of pieces. Um, uh, thanks, Robin, for this particular perspective. Uh, another perspective that I come from is that uh, increasingly where I live and work and practice, I find that people are asking me to explain uh, explain the clients that we uh, that we have in common. Part of collaboration means understanding who you're working with, and very often specialized knowledge of sexual abuse and the people who commit it. Um, really goes lacking. We've never needed case uh, conceptualization uh, more than we do today. And all too often I get concerned that our programs can be very good at um, telling people why they should change without actually having studied why an individual would want to change. And we tell our clients very often how to change, but we haven't done a lot of research uh, on how human beings actually change. And as a result, we, we spend a lot of time persuading when we should spend more time accepting the fact that clients very often can and do change in the most um, inexplicable of, of ways. And so for me, uh, being able to explain the life of a client uh, and offer some kinds of insights as to how they're going to move forward is extremely important. And so. Uh, very good. Anything else to say on that, Robin? I was going to talk a little bit about our authors. Yeah, there was just one thing that I wanted to add. Is that you know I think we also need to be mindful of the fact that that not all of our clients engage in in the problematic behavior for the same reason, um, and that sometimes we make assumptions about how they got to where they are that are maybe not entirely truthful or maybe not entirely fair if you looked at the big picture. So I think this this you know perspective of, of you know, spending a lot of time figuring out what you're going to do before you embark on actually doing something uh, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, excellent. 
And so uh, I just wanted to introduce you to some of the uh, some of the authors who contributed to this uh, project. Starting up uh, at the uh, at the left and in the top row, you see uh, Rob Longo who contributed a chapter on neurofeedback and traumatic brain injury. Um, to uh, uh, to the right of him is George Leibowitz, who uh, contributed a chapter on autism spectrum disorders um, in rural areas. The original uh, thing that we asked George to do was to write about um, how treatment happens in uh, in in very rural areas. Uh, Robin and I each have a friend who lives up in the uh, Finger Lakes region of New York State who contacts us every now and then, trying to find uh, resources in the community and. Um, has a very difficult time doing it. Uh, next to him is uh, Donald Paik, a uh, longtime associate of Robbins. And uh, next to uh, Dr. Paik is, uh, is a friend to many of us, uh, Joanne Schladel, who is one of the best family therapists, um, I think, in, uh, in world history uh, and lives, uh, quite fortunately, uh, here in Maine. Um, then in the second row you see Phil Rich, a familiar face to many of us. Next to him is David Lay, a very interesting author who wrote a book on the uh, called uh, The Myth of Sex Addiction, which is really worth a look. Um, he's not one to avoid controversy and just published another book that I haven't read yet called Ethical Porn for Dicks. I'll leave you to um, think about what that might entail, but he uh, he contributes something on case law regarding sexual addiction, which is a, a fascinating chapter. Uh, next to him is uh, is Jamie Yoder, who works uh, with uh, with George Leibowitz uh, on the same chapter. Uh, the handsome man next to her is uh, is none other than Kevin Powell, uh, who contributes a chapter on strength based approaches. Next to him is Thomas Graves, who wrote a chapter on treating a man with pedophilic disorder that I think is one of the uh, uh, the best chapters on the topic that I've ever read um, anywhere. Uh, uh, Thomas Graves is really somebody to watch. The lower left hand corner we have Pamela Yates. Next to Pamela is uh, Jordan Hoth, uh, who um, is a uh, an excellent practitioner and uh, doesn't write as much about his work as he should. Next to him is Patrick Little, who contributed a, uh, a chapter called There's an App for That. I'll just leave you with that idea. Uh, next to uh, Patrick is uh, Kathy Prentice from Bis uh, Brisbane, Australia, who does a fabulous chapter on trauma-informed care. And then the last person in the lower right-hand corner is Gwen Willis. Uh, she and Pamela Yates and I did a chapter um, on the Good Lives model, a, uh, a case example of that. So, Robin, why don't you uh, take us away on uh, your case of Johnny? Yeah, indeed. And, uh, you know, I do want to make sure to to, uh, to give a shout out to Donald Paik, who was the uh, who was the driving force behind this chapter. I just get to be the one that talks about it. He did did the bulk of the work, and in fact, when this case was problematic for us, um, he was the one who was actually driving the bus in a lot of it as well. Um, th those of you who work in institutional settings are probably familiar with this sort of thing, although I don't know that many of you would necessarily know it by its its uh, you know sort of fancy name or the one that at least uh, got referred to in some of the early earlier psychiatric literature. This is called this is called this is called de Clarembeau syndrome, and we know it more commonly as as erotomanic fixation. And if you work in an institutional setting, although I'm sure this can happen on the outside as well. And uh, before we came onto the webinar, a bunch of us were sort of talking online about uh, you know about uh, 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 Mr. Hinckley and his his erotomanic fixation on Jodie Foster that led him to shoot shoot President Reagan all those years ago. But this, this commonly ha happens in an institutional setting, especially in those, those settings where you have a lot of people who, with sexual abuse sorts of issues. Um, and in this particular, uh, ish, uh, this particular case, we had, we had a male offender in, in a high intensity treatment center who uh, had a habit of becoming fixated on, on female staff. And the case that we write about was the first time that he'd had these difficulties. Um, so he became fixated on a female staff member. She was not really uh, well versed in knowing what to do with this sort of thing, um, but did have the good sense, of course, to speak to her supervisor and say, I'm a little bit concerned about how every time I turn a corner, there's Johnny, or he's always there to, to get the door for me, hold the door for me, and I'm starting to get letters slipped under my office door that are really quite concerning. So we, um, 
we took a multidisciplinary approach to this. Um, the first thing we did, and you know, not so much as a punishment, but as, as a kind of protective measure, we took them out of the general population and we put them into to, uh, you know, not, not segregation so much. You know, I guess he was segregated from the, from the full population, but he was removed from the opportunity to interact with the staff member. And we had some concerns, uh, you know, given his offense history, that he might actually engage in some sexually violent behavior with her. We wanted to make sure that didn't happen. So we took them out of, you know, out of the general population for, for safety's sake. And while he was there, we then started to focus on what was happening, where, where some of these uh, feelings about staff members were coming from, what some of his history was. So we really wanted to get a sense of what was it that he was trying to achieve or what was it that, that was perhaps in his history that you know, somehow suggested to him that this was, you know, this was appropriate conduct. So um, um, our psychology division spent a lot of time talking with him, doing some exploration of that. And we also wanted to take a look at whether or not there was a psychiatric link here. Uh, and this client did have some, some psychiatric issues. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that if there was, was some other avenue to take a look at here, that we got him to the institutional psychiatrist and had some look at that. Um, what ultimately happened was uh, his meds were changed. He uh, was able to continue to, to go to his treatment groups. Uh, he would be escorted to and from those groups uh, so that he wouldn't get himself into trouble on the way there or the way back. And, um, uh, you know, got him to do some extra work as well. Uh, in terms of the psychiatric approach, uh, we switched him to a high dose SSRI, I believe, and, and got him also started on some medications to deal with the compulsiveness. Um, over a span of about four to six months, uh, we saw some real changes in, in his belief system, or at least uh, he, you know, how he was thinking about himself and his interactions with staff members to the extent that we were ultimately able to release him back into the general population. Um, to my knowledge, he never expressed any further difficulties with this particular staff member, and I haven't heard any rumblings. Um, I, I don't work at that center anymore, but I do have some friends who are still there. Um, I don't believe that he has engaged in this behavior any further. Um, so I, I thought we were pretty successful in actually intervening with this guy. We prevented him from engaging in any further sexually abusive behavior, which would have made a, a real difficult uh, time for him in terms of his possibility of ever going back to the community. And we were able to protect the staff member. Uh, and I think it was a really good learning experience for the entire institution in terms of how we would be able to deal with these cases going forward. So it was great for us to be able to write about this and to be able to share our experience and our perspectives on this with others. All right. Thanks, Robin. So I, in the interest of time, I'm going to keep this very, very brief. I, uh, I elected to do a case of a... Uh, a uh, young man who had uh, what looked to be an emerging diaper fetish. Uh, there is nothing to stir up uh, professional angst in a residential treatment center more than the, uh, the young person who wants to wear diapers and is willing to go out and steal them uh, in, order to, uh, in order to do so. And uh, I got called to consult on this, uh, on this case, went and interviewed the young man um, had to do a risk assessment and uh, um, all sorts of, uh, of other things and actually found that a great deal of my task was figuring out how to, um, how to calm the, uh, the professionals uh, in the case down. When you think about an adolescent boy wearing diapers, that's a, uh, that's a big, big, big concept right there. And I found that uh, what I had to do was use motivational interviewing first just to get to know uh, and work with uh, this young man. I had to approach him in a spirit of uh, partnership and acceptance um, and true compassion and, uh, and evocation uh, or else he wasn't going to be able to talk to me. Uh, at all, and then sort of following my own personal uh, belief that uh, when in doubt, it's best to chunk it out. We then uh, had several conversations where we talked about the the pros and cons of owning diapers, stealing them, uh, to what extent he received uh, a sense of soothingness from them, 
to what extent, if any, he might experience uh, sort of emotional congruence with uh, with very small uh, with very small children. Just as importantly, we explored his overall sense of identity. This was a young man who uh, certainly enjoyed wearing diapers, but didn't want to be the kind of person who uh, who wears them or who has worn them. And so we had uh, many motivations uh, to explore with him. What I found, to actually borrow a phrase from uh, from Joanne Schladel, was that the uh, the slower I went in interviewing this young man, the uh, the faster we arrived uh, at our destination. So my job was to uh, to calm and soothe the staff who were trying to calm and soothe him, and uh, we uh, picked apart the various uh, components. Um, of this uh, of this behavior, and like Robin's case, uh, this turned out to be a young man who went on to uh, really reject the use of uh, wearing diapers, but for his own reasons, and uh, generally speaking, moved on with his life uh, with no further difficulties. And so, the number one specific skill that we all had to bring to the table was to reserve judgment to demonstrate compassion, to think not only in terms of um, wanting to, uh, to honor who this young man was um, in the moment, but also uh, to uh, honor the, uh, who he wanted to be in the future, wherever uh, that might go. Increasingly, many of us talk about compassion. When I talk about compassion, I mean the demonstration of empathy combined with the intention to prioritize the long-term best interests of uh, of every uh, of every client, this means that I have to have a generally sex positive outlook. Um, I have known many professionals in our field um, who would like nothing more than to uh, work with people who have abused uh, by ending their <laughs> frankly ending their sex life uh, once and for all in that moment, and uh, that was not going to uh, be the right thing to do for this client. Um, also, above all, we needed to reject uh, something called the writing reflex which was that reflexive instinct that everybody involved in the case had to, uh, to end this behavior and nip it in the bud um, in the here and now. Uh, in order to work with this kid, I needed to use a lot of specific uh, micro skills, including reflective listening, and then to listen for the least, the, the least apparent little signs that he was willing to lead his life in a way that was going to get him what he wanted uh, in the long run. So I refer to this as elaborating change talk, that's the motivational interviewing uh, term, and uh, used a lot of, uh, whenever I would hear the slightest indication of a willingness to change, my general uh, sort of schema, uh, the way that I worked was to uh, invite him to tell me more. And so uh, that's just the, uh, the, the five cent tour um, of, uh, of the case of Dan and the uh, uh, the diaper fetish. So, um, Robin, do you want to talk a little bit more about collaboration? Yeah, I mean, definitely. You know, I, I, I've throughout my career realized that I'm I'm incapable of of doing well by myself. That I really do need to bring other people in on things. And you know, certainly the partnership that I've had with you, David, has really defined a lot of of the last ten or fifteen years of of my life. Uh, you know, in terms of the projects that we've worked together. And I think that 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 was what we really wanted to pull together in terms of the book was to, to give people a sense of what different perspectives are out there to raise some some new questions other than the ones that we've heard heard uh, you know more consistently over the years so working together it certainly brought out the best in me um, um, hope that it's done the same for you David I'm pretty sure on, on most occasions yeah. it has and uh, you know it's you know one of those things that we learned when we were way back in kindergarten and you know the idea that that you know sharing feels good and that uh, um, I would much rather do something with others than do it by myself uh, and you know certainly with all the work that I do with the COSA model you know circles of support stuff um, I know what can happen when people become isolated so being able to share our thoughts and, and, and uh, things in this you know this interesting project with the, I don't know, 206 people who are online with us today is also really cool. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. And, you know, I'm going to uh, extend that, uh, that kindergarten metaphor uh, just a little bit, uh, but take it into a slightly different direction. 
So the implications of all of this for, for many of the professionals gets back to this idea of beware of false advertising. And that very often we hear about this new, shiny, cool treatment technology uh, and we forget that very often the most effective part of any given model is not necessarily that which is new. And likewise, the most interesting part of a new model might not be what actually makes it effective. Um, that uh, to extend this, as I indicated earlier, there can be more difference between the best and the worst therapists within a particular model or approach than there is between them. And that therefore the most impactful part of the equation is you. I'm going to give a shout out to a, uh, uh, a woman that I'm working with um, in Massachusetts named Kathy. We, uh, uh, we do some groups together and one of the things that I have noticed about Kathy is that she, uh, as, um, as part of the equal uh, co-facilitation relationship, what she really brings to the table, even more than specific expertise in the area, is a kind of openness to feedback from her clients. Anytime they, uh, they give her any kind of feedback at all, her attitude is one of gentle surprise and saying, oh, this is great, thank you for the feedback, because now I can take some kind of action on this. And it makes me realize that very often uh, we, we very definitely need specialized knowledge in our field, but that sometimes who we are uh, can be as important um, as what we do. So uh, Robin, some implications for research? Yeah, I mean definitely one of the things that, that we wanted to highlight in this book was with some of the areas that maybe we don't talk about nearly as much. Um, we seem to be as a field pretty good at doing uh, you know, kind of those sort of sort of quantitative recidivism outcome studies. So we can take a program, we can run it, we can look at pre and post measures and we can say you know this person seemed to have gotten better on these these particular uh, you know dynamic risk factors or whatever the case may be. We follow them for five years and we see that the group of people who were who were in the program reoffend less than some some randomly assigned group or a match sample or you know the larger population of sex offenders in general. Um, so we have some sense that there was something that we did that worked, but I think we don't necessarily always know exactly what that spark was. Um, and you know certainly David raised this you know just you know, just a moment ago. It's it's all well and good to know that we did something right. It's much better for us to know exactly what it was that we did right and why. We, doing it the way we did it uh, got us the outcome that we wanted to get. Um, this last point here on this slide is, is one that I, I stole from David. It's actually one of my, one of my favorite Prescottisms. Um, I'm not sure if he stole it from someone or not, but, uh, but we're going to give it to him today. Uh, and, 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 you know, David often says, it's important to remember that as much as we can help people get better, we can also make them worse. So I think it's really important for us, if we're going to be true to that responsivity principle, that we really do want to have some sense of what is it that we're doing with people. If it's working, why is it working? Is it about the person who's offering the service, or is it about some specific way in which that service is being offered? And you know, getting down to that spark, the sort of core bit of, of uh, why it's, 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 it's giving us the outcome that we'd like to see. Nice. Excellent. And so uh, I know we want to get on to some questions. Let me just, uh, yeah, here we go. As far as I'm concerned, the most important implications, reading through these chapters, reading through all of the research that I can, gets back to something um, that's actually in the circles of support and accountability research. Ultimately, the safest person who is sexually abused is the person who is stable, who's occupied with a job or education, has supportive people to whom he can be accountable and is accountable, has plans for the future, and has everything to lose by, by doing it again. And uh, so Robin, any, uh, any last words before we, uh, we take questions? No, I'm just looking, that's an that's interesting little acronym there. It's SOAP with an E on the end, so it's the SOAPy approach. Um, yes, I like and I, the SOAPy approach, that's right. How are you going to keep yourself clean? That's, yes, right. that's right. So, yeah. so I, I have to say, yes. Well, I, I'm afraid I did steal that one uh, from uh, uh, from Doug Bauer. But um, 
just the same. Um, <laughs> it 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 uh, it certainly fits. He's uh, he's written along uh, on, along very similar lines, which goes to show the extent to which so much of our research uh, converges. Uh, the real question, I think, for the rest of us is. Uh, are we going to listen to what the research says, but also how are we going to uh, put the research together in ways that are actually going to be helpful uh, to our clients, but also, uh, I think, uh, helpful to society and to keep professionals um, lasting in the field. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to uh, exit my slideshow and ask, uh, uh, Craig, do you want to have some Q&A at this point? I'll also turn on my camera. There we are. All right. The bearded wonders. <laughs> yeah. Pop up. I'll, I'll see if I can get this here. But first, I want to apologize for giving Robin a new identity. Um, Robin, of course, <laughs> is Wilson, not Williams. And I, it's so ironic because as I was going through my notes beforehand and just going over it thinking, oh my God, I hope I don't say Robin Williams instead of Robin Wilson. And there you have it. I think it. we've all done that. So, so much for rehearsal. It uh, gets you nowhere. <laughs> um, <I'm, laughs> I've just gone through all my slides there and screwed this up totally. So, well, um, one question, I'll keep working on that, but I'll give you guys a couple questions to work on. And one of the things that struck me is that this is very much not a one-size-fits-all approach that you're talking about through all of this. And I would like to ask each of you to comment on the case that you described on what were the needs that you identified of the person. Uh, in other words, it wasn't just power and control. It was something else. And so how did you identify that with the client? What did you decide the need was? And then how do you factor in um, intellectual level, mental illness, learning style in designing your intervention, the responsivity part. How do you shape your teaching intervention based on what you learn about the intellectual, emotional, mental illness features of the client? And with that, I'll try to get my slide back on the screen here. Sure. Robin, you want to go first? Yeah. Um, in our work with our client who became fixated on, on, you know, in this case, one particular staff member, but who had had that difficulty in other places as well. He had had some very difficult developmental abuse uh, sorts of situations. He had a, a father who was not particularly good at the job, who, uh, who was quite a philanderer and who uh, didn't have a lot of uh, you know, sort of value for women, saw them as a means to an end. And he also had uh, some experiences of having been, been sexually abused um, in, his, in his formative years. Um, I think most most uh, pertinently um, in one scenario where uh, um, um, a female had spent a lot of time, you know, spending time with him, grooming him, treating him like he was quite special. Um, and I think when he found himself, uh, you know, engaging in the same sort of behavior as his father, uh, you know, also being quite, you know, sexually obsessed and engaging in a lot of inappropriate sexuality with both adults and children in a kind of uh, a preoccupied sort of way. Um, I think what, what he, he did was he transferred his belief system around intimacy to these, these sort of what he saw as being kind of relationships uh, where, they, you know, where they clearly weren't. He was engaging in you know, sexually abusive conduct. But I think the need that he was trying to fill was was the need to be close to someone and to have some sort of intimacy with them, which he had completely sexualized. So being in an institutional setting where there's very much an us and them sort of approach to things and where you're not allowed to have any any physical contact, even handshaking is you know often uh, you know frowned on, um, and having any sort of social interaction with people other than the other residents uh, is is you know also kind of verboten. He was in a situation where he was completely cut off of having any intimacy with the sort of people that he might have any sexual interest in. And uh, I think he found that quite frustrating. And the way for him to, to meet some of that was to transfer it all onto one particular staff member and to try to build the sort of relationship with her that he had had as a teenager in the sexually, uh, in sexually inappropriate relationship he had with an older female. Um, in terms of, of, of his other needs, I mean, he also had a, 
a really wonky view of his place in society. Uh, and I suppose that's a nice way of saying he was he was kind of uh, kind of psychopathic in his approach to the world. He was quite narcissistic, very selfish, and um, you know I think that was one of the complicating factors for us was that it wasn't the first time he'd found himself in this sort of situation, which is why we really wanted to take a, you know, a very multidisciplinary coordinated approach to dealing with it this time so as to make sure that it didn't end up going ahead uh, you know, once he got back out into the open population just finding another staff member to fixate on. And do, you have any thoughts, do you have any thoughts about how his intellectual level or learning style affected how you would try to change his behavior or help him change? Yeah, he, he was a very bright individual. Um, in, in, in group, he was the sort of guy who would always have something to say, um, often insightful. But the problem, I think, was that, is that he was coming up with insightful things so that we would think that he was insightful. Um, and that it wasn't so much that he was actually trying to make those big time changes in his life. I think he was trying to garner, you know, sort of positive affect from us and say, wow, Johnny, that was a great way you did that. You, uh, you know, you're an awesome treatment participant without necessarily uh, actually incorporating any of those changes into his behavior. He could very clearly tell us what he was doing wrong. He just didn't, didn't particularly do much about it. Great. Thank you. David, how about your guy? Sure. Um, again, in the interest of time, um, I, I think now I, uh, I, I'm a strong advocate, as is Robin, uh, and I suspect you are too, Craig, of person first language. Um, I think of these as people who have sexually abused, people who have been victimized or traumatized, um, and what have you. However, um, borrowing from something that Carl Hansen once observed, um, there's a time and a place to look at the term juvenile sex offender uh, for my guy. And the reason I'm saying that is because there's a juvenile component, there's a sex component, and there's an offense component um, in, this, uh, in this person's behavior. And my job was to break these components down uh, for, the, for the benefit of the staff who were going to wind up working with him they were concerned about the sex piece and I was more concerned about uh, the willingness to engage in theft of diapers or um, other kinds of behaviors that were going to bring him into conflict with the law and to bring um, the goals of his life into conflict with each other uh, frankly. Um, I was aware this is a guy who is young and unattached but who desperately wanted uh, to have attachment. Um, he also had his own trauma history and had absolutely no clue um, how, to, uh, how to calm himself down. He was so on edge uh, at all times. I think you could contract a case of ADHD just by being around him for, uh, for more than an hour at a time. I hope that doesn't sound too, uh, too crass or, uh, or blunt. Um, and so for me it was breaking down these, uh, these components and where we started was simply getting him um, to explore the ambivalence about being able to behave in a way that would keep him uh, out of trouble. He eventually learned how to follow the rules. Once he was able to follow the rules and kind of manage his own behavior, that gave him more um, leeway to explore basically who he wanted to be as a man, um, who he wanted to be uh, as a sexual being, and what he wanted um, out of his life. From everything I can gather, this was a guy for whom wearing diapers uh, was probably as much a symptom of his own background of trauma as, uh, as anything else. And that once he had both of his feet on the ground, um, uh, working with him to manage his behavior was quite simple. The cognitive shift that the staff had to make was they were thinking, ooh, icky, sticky, creepy sexual behavior, when really the most unacceptable aspect um, of the behavior was actually the more non-sexual aspects having to do with rule rule breaking and uh, being young and unattached. So fortunately I think maturational processes probably took care of a lot of this. I hope I answered your question Craig. Yeah, and what about the um, responsivity part? What did his intellectual um, level, developmental level um, have to do with what you decided was your best intervention approach? In, in his case, interestingly enough, he was also very intelligent but had really significant learning disabilities. 
Um, and so a lot of the uh, intervention had to do uh, uh, as much with making sure that he could access the educational services that were available uh, to him. And then we, um, we worked hard to get him uh, jobs, both on and off the campus of the program. Um, so that he could start to feel a little bit more, uh, a little bit more competent. The responsivity issue, though, was here's an intelligent kid who also has significant learning disabilities. So we often looked more high functioning than he actually was, which could lead to frustration and intolerance on the part of the uh, of the staff that were around him. But they got through it. Mm -hmm. One thing I really like about the approach you guys are are presenting is. Although both of these guys were high functioning and had good verbal skills, I imagine that if they had 30 point lower IQ, you would have had a different approach based on what they brought to the table, what they were able to understand. And maybe you would have talked less and done some other things with them to get the same result. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Dan was talking cure all the way. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Um, I think we have just about reached um, the end of our time here. Was there a last question there, Tim, that, that came up? I haven't seen one in the window. There was oh, a, a couple, actually, two or three. Okay, I have not seen them in my little window, and I apologize. There are windows all over my computer here, and I'm just figuring out where things are popping up. And we're available um, online, and I think in the past what's happened is um, Tim or uh, whoever uh, has been able to gather those questions and then send them to us, and um, if we can, we're certainly happy to send an email that could go out with the CEs or whatever. Okay. Right, and, um, and you know, I always say this, and I know David feels the same way, every workshop or anything that I do comes with a lifetime guarantee. If you can find me, I'll be happy to answer questions about things. And if you're having a hard time finding me, just, just go into Google and type Robin Wilson sex. I'm like the first 10 hits. And I actually yeah. checked out David, and I think he's the first 12 hits. So if you put David Wilson, or sorry, David Prescott sex into Google, you'll find them real easy. Well, on that note, um, Tim, yes. if you will switch back to my slides, please. I think I are, you, are, you have already. All right, great. Thank you. Um, so... One of the things I want to do is um, thank again our new CE credit sponsor, the Global Institute for Forensic Research. Uh, we're now able to offer free CE credits for all who attend the live webinars, not the recorded ones, for the 2016-2017 year. We're pleased to offer this perk to our sponsors and all who attend the live webinars today and in the future. An email will be sent to you directly following this webinar with instructions on how to receive the credits if you signed up. If you don't receive it within 24 hours of, please, of the presentation, please check your spam folder to make sure that the email hasn't been segregated. Um, I want to take a moment to let people know that we also put together a monthly newsletter where we identify a couple of controversial, um, or sorry, a current or controversial research paper and talk about the finding and the implications that this might have for the individual clinician for this field. You're automatically signed up for this resource. And um, we hope you find it useful. We certainly have great discussions, and we enjoy putting it together at our end. If you like this webinar, you can see previous webinars on our website at www.nuripress.com. It's possible to pay for CE credits for all past recorded webinars, as well as earning free CE credits for the live webinars. And as I mentioned earlier, if you become a sponsor for this year's webinar series, we will send you two NERI's most popular titles, Current Applications and Current Perspectives, or two new books if you have already received the ones that we're offering. You're guaranteed a seat at all webinars in the 2016-2017 series, and if you're an organization, you're guaranteed 15 seats. We will also do your monthly registration for you. Sponsorship is $98 for individuals and $250 for organizations. If you're interested in being a sponsor, please contact us directly at info at nearypress.org, or you can call us at 413-540-0712, extension 14. That's 413-540-0712, extension 14. And a reminder, the PowerPoint slides are currently posted, and a recording will be posted on the website next week. Free CE credits are available. Please go to the webinar page for instructions on how to purchase CE credits. Please do complete the evaluation. A link will be sent to you when you sign off. And finally, I would like to thank our 
speakers today again, Robin Wilson and David Prescott, for a fascinating uh, and very interesting presentation. Thanks again, guys, and hope to see you again you. soon.